Welcome back, everyone, to the next chapter of The Afterlife of Holly Chase. And as you know, we left off at Chapter 11, where Holly really wanted to get access to Dave's office so that she could see Ethan's schedule because she wanted to see him again in real life. Even though she's not supposed to do that, she still is trying to go forward with that. So, let's see what happens. The Afterlife of Holly Chase, Chapter 12. I invited Stephanie over for dinner at my apartment. As in, I told her to bring me a pizza. Wow, your place is great, she panted after I buzzed her in and she stepped up the four flights of stairs. So cozy. I didn't bother to show her around. She could see pretty much all of it from the doorway. Stephanie set the pizza on the middle of my little kitchen table. She was wearing a mint green sweater with a cartoon hamburger on it. Only the hamburger had a giant eye and possibly a pair of fangs, like it was alive and about to attack you. I couldn't stop staring at it. Do you have some plates? She asked after a minute. I broke out my stash of Diet Coke and a couple of mugs and got out two plates. I gave her the chip one with the blue flowers. She acted like it was the finest china. I don't live far from here, she informed me as we sat eating the pizza, about three blocks away off St. Mark's. So we're practically neighbors. We should hang out more often. It was an unfamiliar feeling having someone over at my place. It made me feel naked in a way. Because if I showed up at work with my hair and makeup done perfectly, wearing the right clothes, black skinny jeans, and a nice white button-up rolled at the sleeves was my typical look. Nobody would really know how utterly shabby my life was. But now, this girl was here to witness it firsthand. And she was trying to be nice and tell me how great she thought it was. Such a pretty plate. Such a cozy place, such a nice view, but that made it all seem worse to me. So you're a ghost, right? She asked. Does that mean that you're dead? I choked on my Diet Coke. Stephanie waited patiently for me to stop coughing. She didn't pester me, but her expression clearly said, Well, are you? Yes, I finally answered, and no. What does that mean? I died once, but clearly I'm still kicking, aren't I? She laughed, but she felt bad for me. Obviously, poor dead me. I thought so. I was talking to the Copperfield the other day, and he was telling me about how it happened with him. And it occurred to me that you must be dead too. So how did you die? The way I saw it, the less she knew about the circumstances surrounding my death, the better. If she knew I was a failed Scrooge, she'd never be able to trust me, and I needed her to trust me, or this new plan of mine was never going to work. Car accident, I sputtered, which was not exactly a lie. I'm so sorry, she said, like I just told her that my grandma had passed away. She leaned forward with her elbow on the table and put her chin in her hand. What is like being dead? I shrugged, bored. When you're alive, Really alive, I mean, you change a little bit every day. But when you're dead, nothing really changes. You're just the same, day in and day out. Except that day with Ethan, I reminded myself, when it felt like everything changed. But you eat and sleep and use the bathroom like everybody else, right? I can, but I don't have to, I explained. If I didn't want to, I wouldn't have to eat or sleep. I couldn't starve to death or die of exhaustion because in the morning, my body would just start over again. Her eyes were wide. Your body starts over again every morning? Uh-huh. I didn't know how to explain that to her, so I didn't even try. There are definite advantages of being dead. I grabbed another piece of pizza. For instance, I can eat anything I want and not gain weight. She had the good sense to look envious. My hair never grows, so I never have to dye my roots, I said, twisting a golden curl around my finger, and I wouldn't even get old or be old enough to vote. I thought again about Ro and her job and her date and the way she was following her dreams, which made my chest feel tight. Stephanie squinted at my part line. What colors your hair really? On the other hand, I continued, 
every single morning I have to cover up this tiny little zip right here. I pointed at it. I mean, every single day. It's like I'm stuck in never-ending puberty. It sucks. You can't even see it, she says. She was so nice, so freaking nice, too nice. I can imagine how that would be hard, though, she said. The unchanging part. It would make it tough to have normal relationships, I think. How would you make friends if you always stay the same and everyone else just naturally moves on with their lives? Well, this was a depressing conversation. Stephanie tucked a strand of corn silk colored hair behind her ear. I'm sorry, that was rude. I'm just interested in this whole dead but alive thing. I'm a psych psychology major, can't you tell? Yeah, sometimes she seemed like a little girl. Sweet and clueless and likely to remain that way forever, no matter how old she got. But other times, I reminded that Stephanie was actually a college student, something that I would never be. And there were real, honest-to-goodness thoughts going on behind those big purple glasses of hers. Maybe she was smarter than I gave her credit for. I only hope she wasn't too smart. Anyway, she said, you said you needed help with something. I took a deep breath. This was either my best idea ever or my worst one. First off, I just wanted to say thank you for what a stellar assistant you've been the past few months. I know I was a little wary in the beginning, but now I actually feel like you're part of the Project Screwed family. Stephanie gasped and put a hand over her heart. Oh, thank you, Holly. That means so much. I mean it, really. So what can I help you with? She asked. Because you know i do anything to help you. I believe in you and all that you're doing at Project Scrooge. Great. I, um, God, this was nerve-wracking. It was now or never. I need access to Dave's office so I can get Ethan's schedule. Boom. There it was. Her head tilted to one side. She finished chewing a bite of pizza and swallowed. Why? Here it was, my big confession. I want to talk to Ethan in real life. You mean when he's awake? Yes, that's my plan. Her mouth dropped open for a few seconds. Why would you do that? Because Ethan's not like other Scrooges, I said. Showing up with him on Christmas Eve is going to be enough to save him. He needs more direction, more direct intervention. He needs someone in his life to help him change. Someone young who understands what he's going through. Stephanie shook her head. But that's not how we do things, Holly. I know, I know. But I think this is an extreme case here, which is why I like to risk it. Because I really, really believe it's the only way we're going to pull it off this year. Someone has to go the extra mile. Stephanie still looked doubtful. So you would... What, just talk to him? I nodded, basically, and get him to talk to me. You can accomplish a lot just by listening to someone. And I try to provide him something positive in his life. I become his friend. Sometimes all a person needs to turn themselves around is one good friend. I was getting through to her. I could tell by the look on her face. Okay, that might be true, she said. I guess I've had my doubts about this just show them the error of their ways approach if I'm being totally honest. But then, what will happen on Christmas Eve? We still have to go through the performance part of the process, right? Right. But when you went to show Ethan his past, he'd recognize you. He'd know something strange was going on, and that could undo everything. I'd already thought this through. He wouldn't recognize me, I said quietly. The costume is pretty extreme. Trust me. If I was wearing it right now, you wouldn't know it was me. She bit her lip. I don't know, Holly. You have to trust me, I said. I've been doing this job for a long time. I just have this feeling about it. Sometimes that's something that happens when you're a ghost. You sense things that ordinary people don't. And there's definitely a feeling I've had about Ethan Winters ever since Blackpool first called his name. It's like a little voice in the back of my mind telling me I have to do something big, something extra. So when that kind of thing happens, when I feel that special intuition, I try to pay attention to it 
let it guide me. Stephanie was still biting her lip. Then she said, you're right. I hardly dare to breathe. I'm right. I trust you to know that to know what you're doing. And if you're saying you're being guided by something, something obviously bigger than us, you know, you should do what it's telling you. She smiled bravely. I'll help you. Whatever you need, I'll do it. I poured her a little more Diet Coke. You can't tell anyone at the office. They wouldn't understand. They're so stuck on the way that's always done things, you know. She grinned. This is kind of exciting, like we're secret agents. Exactly like secret agents, I pointed out. I get a big, big trouble if anyone at Project Scrooge ever find out what we're doing. We both get in big trouble. I'm like a vault. She made that lip-zipping motion again and then beamed at me. I won't breathe a word. Cool, I said. I couldn't help smiling. I knew I could count on you. What do you need me to do first, she asked. We have to get in today's office. We need to know about the surveillance shifts, who and when each member of his team is assigned to monitor Ethan. And we need a detailed description of Ethan's daily schedule. I know just how to get that, she said. Her bad, which for some crazy reason would work on Dave's office door when mine wouldn't. Cupcakes, she said. Nobody can resist cupcakes. Huh? You'll see. Cupcakes, Stephanie called out in the middle of the hall at exactly 11.30 in the next morning. Operation Cupcake, as she called it, was a go. There are cupcakes in the go room. That got everyone's attention fast. Heads started popping out of doors and people began shuffling down the halls just as fast as their feet could carry them to the free cupcakes. Pretty soon, the go room was crowded with people stuffing their faces with cupcakes. Plus, we had chips and a veggie tray with dip and soda and the song A Holly Jolly Christmas was playing on the loudspeaker. All Stephanie, by the way, I hated that song. I made one just for you. See, it has an M. Stephanie handed a cupcake to Marty, who was staring at her kind of glazy-eyed. Uh, thanks, Stephanie, he mumbled. Thanks a lot. It wasn't just the cupcakes attracting the attention either. We stayed up all night baking, and somehow in the delirium of this morning, I decided to give Stephanie a makeover. So today, she was wearing a charcoal gray pencil skirt and a lavender Dolce & Gabbana top I found on clearance rack at Bloomingdale's a few years ago. The lavender was a good color on her. It brought out the blue of her eyes. It'd be better if she were wearing contacts, but she didn't have any, and she was as blind as a bat without her glasses, she said. Still... The shimmery violet eyeshadow and mascara I put on her, a dash of blush and highlight on her cheekbones, some mouthwash and a rose petal colored lipstick, she was looking much better than usual. I curled her long blonde hair and pinned it into a simple updo that escaped down her back. She was a bit wobbly in my black suede heels knockoffs, but more attractive than Stephanie's inventory of terrible flats. But the look rocked on her. She appeared to be a college-age business professional for once, like a bona fide grown-up. Hey, where'd you get that cup? Grant shuffled into the go room and came to a full stop in front of Stephanie. Whoa, what happened to you? You look nice. She frowned, revealing these cute little bumps on her forehead. You don't like how I usually look? Grant snatched the back of his neck. Oh no, I love how you usually look. It's just that you look extra nice today. Thank you, she smiled sweetly. Hey, could you do me a little favor? Whatever my lady desires, he said. She laughed. Could you just help me pass these out? She handed him a tray of cupcakes. And off they went together, with Marty following behind, hoping for another cupcake. Out of the corner of my eye, I spotted Boz cruising past the go room with his typical long leg strides, but then he paused and came back to the door to watch Stephanie and Co. dispense their sugary goodness. He seemed momentarily confused. What's going on in here? Is this your doing, Havish Ham? 
I raised my hands in mock surrender. Don't look at me. It was all Stephanie's idea. Their French vanilla with fudge frosting. Boss went over and got a cupcake. This is delicious, he said between mouthfuls. Now I need tea. I pointed to the electric teapot in the corner. Stephanie really had thought of everything. I was going to get some myself, but just then, Dave strolled in with a bunch of his people looking both confused and delighted, which was what I'd been waiting for. Cupcakes! Get a cupcake! Stephanie sang out. I love cupcakes, Dave exclaimed. Time for me to go. There were very few stragglers in the hall, and if I saw one, I said something like, There are cupcakes in the go room. Hurry and get one before they're gone. And then they start running. Just before I reached Dave off his door, I stopped and looked around. Nobody was watching. I zipped up the hoodie just in case and pulled over the hood. Then I slipped that Stephanie's badge out of my pocket and swiped it. The door beeped and swung open. I was in. I took a quick glance around. There was no one in the surveillance room. Stephanie was so right. People couldn't resist cupcakes. I went straight to Dave's computer and searched through his files until I found Ethan's schedule. Then I went into the back room and wrote down a list of all the working cameras that were watching Ethan. Done and done. It had been like 15 minutes by then, so I hurried to locate the last piece I needed, the work schedule for Dave's team. Okay, I couldn't find it. Dave didn't have it in his computer. I went to search in his desk, and that's why I discovered a folder with my name on it. Havisham, in big black letters across the edge. I'd seen it before. Under Boz's arm, the first time I met him in his office. I opened it to a random page, and it started reading. 1. Excessive materialism. It read in careful, familiar-looking handwriting. Bothers, I assume. P.S. Limit her access to money. Make her work for what she has. Nar narcissism. A focus solely on herself with no awareness of the people around her. I heard voices in the hall. At the same moment, my phone buzzed in my pocket. It was a text from Stephanie. They're coming. Get out of there. Quick. I slammed the folder shut and stuck it back where I found it. I looked around in a panic, totally freaking out for all the five seconds before I remembered that they wouldn't be able to see me. Hurry, hooray for the hoodie. I only had to be quiet and stay out of their way. The door beeped, and some guy whose name I didn't know came in with Tox, which was slightly confusing because Tox was on my team. She didn't belong in Dave's office any more than I did. My favorite's the peanut butter kind, she was saying. There's a shop in Midtown that makes the best peanut butter and jelly ones. I'm serious. I prefer carrot, the guy said, but vanilla with fudge frosting is a close second. I held my breath as they passed through Dave's office and into the surveillance room. Then I tiptoed to the door, turning the handle very, very slowly as I pushed it open. My eyes suddenly focused on the paper taped on the back of the door. It was labeled Scrooge 173 Monitoring Schedule. My work here was done. Stephanie was waiting for me when I burst into my office, breathing hard. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, Holly, she cried when she saw the look on my face. I did my best, I swear. There were so many people and so much noise, and then when I noticed they were gone, I ran into the hall, but they were already almost there, and I did it. I managed to gasp as I flopped into my chair. Her mouth dropped open in a way that reminded me of a cartoon character. You got the files? She squeaked. The stuff you needed, everything, I got it. I laid the notebook in which I'd written down Ethan's schedule and the camera information on my desk and dug into the hoodie pocket for the crumpled paper I snatched off the door. Finally, the smile that had been slowly traveling from my brain to my lips arrived and turned up the corners of my mouth, and then I couldn't stop grinning. It's all here, everything I needed. I knew we could do it, Stephanie said. We make a great team, you know. We did. It was nice to have someone on my side for once. It made me think weirdly about Ro. How we used to just sit around and make each other laugh. The cupcakes was freaking genius, I said. 
I saved you one. Stephanie opened my desk drawer and pulled out a little plate with a beautiful looking cupcake on it. She set it on the desk in front of me. Enjoy. You've earned it. I took a bite. It tasted like sweet, sweet victory. Okay, everyone. We reached the end of chapter 12. Join me again for chapter 13 and let's see how this turns out. See you soon.